What is up, party people? My name is Sage Lewis. I'm coming to you in uh, support from WMVU, Many Voices United. They put my show on the air at WMVU, Many Voices United on Saturdays at 1 p.m. And I record this live because why not? Why not? <laughs> I literally have no idea what I'm going to talk about today, so that's just going to be great. Uh, I used to do Toastmasters. Do you know what Toastmasters is? Toastmasters is this thing where you get up at like 7 a.m. Well, ours was. You, they have them at different times. But you, get, you come as a group together and you practice speech making. And it's been a long time since I did Toastmasters, but you would do this one thing where you would pull a topic out of the hat and you had to speak about it for, I don't know, three minutes. And it was just a good way to practice vamping about nothing for three minutes. Um, but the reason I tell you this is because at the Church of the Nomadic Spirit, a couple of the board members, Unk and Cadillac, want to put together a Toastmasters group for homeless people. Isn't that like the coolest thing you've ever heard of in your life? These two gentlemen who are currently homeless or... Re nah, that's... I don't know. Anyways... They, um, both veterans, I think. Yeah, both veterans. And, uh, a little bit older, probably my age, maybe a little older than me, I'm 50. And they want to do Toastmasters for homeless people. I thought that was the most awesome thing. We now have three leadership, uh, spots. We have Unk and Silly and Cadillac, all three African-Americans. Do we say African-American now, or is it just black? I really don't know. I was chastised recently by somebody that said, it's not 1950 anymore, we don't say African-American. I'm like, I swear we said African-American last year. I prefer black. Not that, I think it's just cooler. Black and white, you know? <laughs> I just like it. I do feel like there is a fight, a, a great spiritual fight between black and white. And normally in media, white is seen as the good guy and black is seen as the bad guys. But... That's just media put out by white people. <laughs> and and I do think it's changing. I think that like um you know Black Panther he's he's all black Batman. So I mean a lot of times people think oh well, you know black means bad. No, 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 no. I think black is cool. And white, I don't, I don't have any emotional feeling towards white. I always wore a black cowboy hat. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Do you guys have a feeling, a preference of what color is cooler? I mean, black is cooler. You can't deny it. You cannot deny that black is cooler than white. It's impossible. That is an absolute, positively factual statement. Black is cooler than white. You just can't can't deny it. Can't deny it. <laughs> Anyways, the Unk is our secretary. Silly is our vice president. And Cadillac is our treasurer. And... Um, Two of the men are homeless. One lives very meagerly. I don't know what his finances are, but, um, and then two of them are from the, you know, are veterans. 
And so that's been really cool because I have this new philosophy that we have to empower people, especially low-income people. We did this really cool state of the city address last night. It was me and two other that turned out to be candidates for running for, well, no, one, political candidates. Uh, It was really great. I'd recommend watching it. Um, And one of them, Christopher Christopher Anderson, is that right? Christopher Anderson? I think so. Christopher... Christopher James Anderson. Yeah, Christopher Anderson. A 21-year-old black, I think. (laughs) I don't know how to say it. Young man uh, is conservative, but man, I was blown away with his... I don't even know why I said but. I was just blown away with his ideas. I think normally because you think of young people and conservatives and you're like... Oh, what could they bring to the table? Well, I'm telling you, a lot, a lot Christopher Anderson brought to the table. Hey! Oh, Shannon's here! Yay, 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 yay. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm sorry I missed all your comments. Let me pull these out so people can watch them. Pop out, baby. Pop out these comments. So good to see you. So, okay, so here it says... um, Shannon says black, definitely. Okay, so black is the thing. Okay, good to know. And uh, Shannon says that's an energy shielding color. I love it. Karen says, ask the person you're speaking to what they prefer, but in your speaking generally, black or African-American would be acceptable. Okay. Uh, Yeah, he is awesome. You're talking about Christopher Anderson? Yes. I have always liked Christopher Anderson, but... I've never had the opportunity to really hear in depth his beliefs, and my Lord, I was blown away. Blown away. His belief is that the problems we have in Akron all stem from poverty. And that is an incredibly insightful statement. Ibram X. Kendi, have you read any of his books? Recommend it. Ibram X. Kendi, his book, uh, here's this guy. Just, wow, MacArthur Genius Fellow. This guy, he wrote his, probably his biggest book. I've read, what have I read? I read How to Be an Anti-Racist and... Oh, who cares what I was stamped, stamped from the beginning. Yeah, for kids. Anyways, uh, how to be an anti-racist. And I don't think I am misconstruing his thoughts to boil it down to uh, poverty, lack of good jobs. You know, if, if, if anybody disagrees with my statements on Ibram X. Kendi, by all means, please correct me. Uh, Yeah, Shannon, you got to meet him in December. Yeah. And so Ibram X. Kendi is the guy. He was the guy uh, that we all went to during the Black Lives Matter movement to understand more deeply racism in America, I believe. I I mean, there were other great authors, but Ibram X. Kendi was, I think, the, the person that gravitated to the top. And really incredibly, incredibly thoughtful. And I learned so much about what even being racist means. I think a lot of times we connotate it to being something evil, but it's not. Racism is not evil. It doesn't, I mean, no, let me state that differently. It doesn't have to come from a place of evilness. Let me say it that way. That racism is a lot of time it's just embedded in our culture and we do it by mistake and he would even call out his racist thoughts throughout his life 
And I can't recall them off the top of my head, and it doesn't matter. I don't want to misstate uh, Professor Kendi. Dr. Kendi? I don't even know. Sorry. Uh, I. But the point is that we have demonized the word racist, and maybe we need a better word, but we are, especially white people in our white fragility, which was also a good book, but got really panned later on because it was written by a white lady. And I don't know what she did, but she kind of screwed up somewhere. But I enjoyed white fragility as well. I, I recommend that book. And we... <laughs> White people get very, very touchy when we're called racist, okay? But Ibram X. Kendi really was saying, look, it's not like that. What we're trying to do is point out mistakes that we make, okay? So let me, let me give you an example of some racist ideas I have. One. Percentage of people in America that smoke menthol cigarettes. Okay. It says 51% of young adults who currently smoke cigarettes uh, report using menthol. 39%, 25 and older, uh, use menthol. But I believe... Yeah, of... Percentage of black, you know, percentage. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's going to get. It's something like 71% of menthol smokers by age race. Okay. So current cigarette smoking was highest among non-Hispanic African Indian Native American adults, the lowest among Hispanic non-Hispanic Asian adults. Okay. Uh, these are so confusing what is it not 27 of non-hispanic anyways let's see what percentage of menthol smokers are black let's just get it right out there so overall cigarettes are female and approximately 25 29 percent of all menthol smokers are black okay so here's the thing all right so here's the deal I give out cigarettes to homeless people I do it every time I'm there it's just fun to do they like cigarettes and blah 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 not all of them, of course. Not all homeless people smoke cigarettes. But I use, I would get menthol cigarettes, and I got regular full-flavored cigarettes, and I got the menthol cigarettes because I thought my homeless black friends wanted menthol cigarettes. Okay? I literally, I mean, that's what I said. I'm like, well, my black friends are going to want menthol cigarettes. My white friends are going to want. Factually, not true. Not true. And in fact, when I got out there and I would say to everybody, menthol or regular, I can't even, there's not even a trend. It's just like, everybody smoked everything. It was, I couldn't do gender studies on it. I couldn't do race studies on it. I didn't write it down. I was just observing. I'm here to tell you, um, I am here to tell you, it wasn't just black people smoking these menthol cigarettes. In fact, it wasn't even mostly black people. Black people, I think, smoked menthol at the same rate as white people. Okay? So, there is a racist thought process, right? I don't think it's hurtful, but it's racist. And it's that kind of thinking that we have to test, right? And I think that it helps me. We are all doing this. Okay, we are all generalizing. We're generalizing about poor people, about homeless people, about black people, about white people, about gay people, LGBTQIA. Buy that. Where? Man, I got too many windows. Karen says cultural humility. 
by Dr. James Knight breaks down many of those barriers. It, it is the posture of humility to listen to others and accept their experience as theirs and not tell their perspective is wrong to make our want real view right. There you go. Shannon says poverty equals despair and then it leads then it and then in turn leads to hopelessness then leading to total breakdown and giving up. I think this is right, Shannon. Uh so I think poverty leads to and then generational poverty where you're poor, your parents are poor, your grandparents are poor, your aunts and uncles are poor, everybody's poor in your family. Everybody's poor. And then you you lead to hopelessness, which is exactly what Shannon is saying here. You lead to hopelessness, and then ultimately that leads to addiction and mental health and crime, I think. I, I think. I mean, am I generalizing there? Do all Are all poor people drug-addicted criminals? Hell no. Hell no. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Of course they are not, but these are things that we need to be aware of. So like as we are as we are watching trends happen, um yeah, and then and then uh Shannon agrees, uh generational, of course. I think generational is so brutal because you're just like everywhere you turn your 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 community is poor, your family's poor and you're just like you're in a ocean of poor poverty and you can't see a way out, you know? Because nobody there's nobody uh doing anything different. So I I like I like to talk about racial stereotypes that I have um because then it helps me then flush them out, that they're living underneath me, right? So let me tell you a conversation I had with some young men, uh, 17, 18-year-old young men uh, this week. I'm not going to, they're just friends of the family. It doesn't matter who they are. White, they were all white, I will say that. And two of these young men work in the construction world. And they said, look, Sage, I'm going to tell you, and they're very thoughtful, thoughtful young men. They're not, you know, they're, they're these enlightened young people that we have today. And they said, I hate to say this, but if you want construction done, you call one of two people, the Amish or the Hispanics. <laughs> He's like, those are the people you want on your jobs, the Amish or the Hispanics. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And he's like, and the Amish are really amazing. He's like, they can, just the way they carry things is better. But he's like, their child labor stuff is shit. He's like, these kids come on these work sites and they're like, you know, four feet tall smoking cigarettes. And the dad's like, oh, he's 18. I'm like, there's no way this kid's 18. So they have these crazy uh, child labor issues that they're doing, these nine-year-old kids on these labor sites. But the, my, this young man I was talking to, you should, he's like, you should see him work. Uh, you, you should see how these, these kids work. They're insane. They lift more than me. Shannon says the need to improve oneself can turn into an addiction. Ah, that's a good point. So, yeah, we have to be so mindful of addiction to anything. So then I was like, well, why aren't there white people? Why is it only just, not that I guess Amish would be white, but, you know, you get it, right? Why is it Amish people and Hispanic people? Where are the white people? And they're like, man, white people don't do this shit. <laughs> and I'm like, why? And he's like, well, they're on the construction sites, but they're running the machines. They're running forklifts. They're running, they're, they're, they're the... They're the uh, truck drivers. And he's like, and they're stupid as shit. They're like, they're like, they're constantly having to repair their uh, their their gas pump at their their factory because these guys pull up to their trucks and they they don't pull up close enough to the 
where they fill up the gas and so they stretch the the hose and they break the hose all the time he's like they're just morons <laughs> and these are white guys talking about white guys okay now we didn't get on to the I, I, we never got to black people okay i don't um, it didn't come up in the conversation but here we are making stereotypes about Amish people, white people, and Hispanic people, okay? Now, I said, that's interesting. Like, and, and these young white guys, they're like, yeah, man, I'm getting my forklift degree. I mean, you know, I'm getting trained on forklifts, and I'm going to get trained. Then we're going we're gonna to be running the, since these moron white guys can't fill up their trucks right, we're, we're getting a truck where at night we fill up the truck so they don't have to screw up the, the pumps. So I'm going to learn how to run the, 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 the truck. And I'm like, that's so interesting that you young white guys aren't hauling the labor. You're learning how to drive the trucks. And I'm like, I just wonder if that's like the trend. That the white guys are on the, on the sites, but they're not doing the labor. It's the Amish guys and the Hispanic guys. And then I'm like, yeah, I think I'd be that guy. That's what I said first. I'm like, yeah, I'd want to I want to learn how to drive a forklift. But then I'm like, no, 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 no. What I want is to be the guy that owns the forklift. And they were like, whoa. I'm like, yeah, bro. That's where you want to be. You don't want to be making forklift money. You want to be making the money that uses the forklift. And they like were like, whoa, man, that's totally cool. And so we get in these ruts, right? We get in these ruts where, you know, the well, Amish people can't drive the forklift. It's just against their religion. Although, don't get me started on seeing Amish people in their boats and at the airport and all that shit. Cedar Point Hospital, I see them everywhere. I'm not anti-Amish. I'm just, you know, it's weird. They're gaming the system. They're gaming the system. Um... Which is fine. Who does game of the system? The system sucks. Get out of what you can get out of it. Who gives a crap? They still can't drive. It still sucks. Um. But then the Hispanic guys. I'm like, why don't you get on the forklift? I mean, I wasn't talking to a Hispanic guy. Why are they? You know. I would imagine that there's probably not a lot of black guys on these construction crews. Okay, and why is that? Why is that? Now, I could be wrong because I didn't talk to him about that. But could it be this generational poverty thing that they these young black guys are looking around and they're not seeing their uncles or aunts or grandparents or dads or moms on construction sites? And so they're just not going there. They're not doing that. I mean, where do we see black people? I see them in the hospitals all the time. I see, like, male black nurses. I see uh, black people at the cafeteria, at, at um, you know, in the basement of Akron General, which is Cleveland Clinic. I see them doing janitorial. I mean, I don't see a lot of black doctors. In fact, it's proven that very few doctors are black. It's way underrepresentative, of course. But I I would imagine that, you know, I see I, I so I see black people in those kinds of jobs, which are good. I see black people in education, which is good. But I don't see them on construction sites. I, I think I'm saying if any of this is like no sage, you are totally this is the most racist conversation I've ever had. You don't even know what you're talking about. But I'm just my whole point of this is if you say this stuff, if you say this stuff out loud, you can start to process it and think about it. Is what I think. I think we have to not be afraid of saying things that are risky or potentially ignorant or offensive, especially if you're doing it from a place of like, hey, man, I'm just trying to figure this crap out. I'm just trying to figure this crap out. Is it or is it not true that there are not many black people on construction sites, roofing, 
uh, building houses. I, I just don't see it. I see Hispanic people, and this is what my friends were saying, Hispanic people and Amish people. Um, and I have, I have other friends that are really down on the Amish. They're like that, uh, they, this, this whole stereotype that Amish are like, you know, you want Amish built stuff is total crap. The, it's not any better than anything I make, said an old white guy I know. <laughs> He's probably just jealous because he doesn't have the brand that the Amish people have. I don't know. I don't know. Is Amish quality better? Who knows? How do I know? But I know the brand, the stereotype. And isn't that what a brand is? Is a stereotype? Mistake on the lake, right? That's you know, when I say that, you know what that is, right? Mistake on the lake. Cleveland, right? Right? Um a brand is a stereotype. Okay? That this race is lazy. This race is drug addicted. This race is good at school. So, like, they, we were talking about that. And then they, they said it always uh, uh, in an apologetic way. They're like, look, again, I hate to say it, but when you look at these Asian kids at our high school, they're all super smart. <laughs> they all took a violin. They all learned less, the violin at age three, and they're great at standardized tests. Okay? Um, Shannon says, maybe it's because their ancestors were used as free labor in construction situations. Wow. Good one. Maybe they're just over it. Maybe they're like, this, this, this shit is generationally triggering. You're not going to catch me in a cotton field. You're never going to catch me building a house because I was, I, you know, slaves built Washington, D.C., for God's sake. Maybe that's it. Maybe they're just like, screw that. I'm not doing that crap. My great great grandfather did that shit for free for a white man, and that shit ain't ever happening in our house. Great point, great point. But then it begs the question: Wouldn't it be cool to have a conversation, right? I mean, would we dare to have this conversation in person? We take a bunch of people from mixed races. We take some Asian people, some black people, Hispanic people, Amish people, white people, and we just start saying this shit. Do you think we'd have enough guts to say it? I think we need to. Because Shannon poses a very good question. Is there something in the black culture that is like anti-construction? I don't know. Or is it just factually wrong, everything I'm saying? Be like, no, man, my, people are in, my family's been in construction for years and years and years. Shut up, Sage, you're an idiot. Like, yeah, yeah, I know I'm an idiot. That's why I'm here, to learn. <laughs> I'm trying to learn. I'm trying not to be an idiot. And the only way I know how to do that is to start saying stupid things so you can correct me. Okay? All right. Do black people like watermelon and chicken more than white people? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I have seen watermelon and chicken at parties with a mixed group of people, and I see equal amounts of people eating both. Okay? I do not believe black people like watermelon and chicken more than white people. Watermelon and chicken is delicious. Don't be stupid. I don't know, but I haven't done the study. Maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's something. Maybe it's something. I, how about this? Greens, okay? Have you ever had greens? Never in my life have I ever had greens until a black person made them for me, and then a poor white lady made them for me. So do poor and black people eat greens more than white people? I think yes, they do. Why? Because white people like me we're never given the opportunity to eat something as delicious as greens. Okay? If you haven't had greens and you are a white middle class person, your life is not complete. Go find some and realize the errors of your ways. I once asked a black man, should I try chitlins? And he's like, no, don't do it. <laughs> I'm like, why not? He's like, you're going to hate him. He's like, it's an acquired taste. It goes way back. It's a thing. My grandparents do it. I like chitlins, he says, but I just don't even do it. Don't do chitlins. Do more black people eat chitlins? Probably. Probably. I, I, he scared me off of them. 
Uh, I'm, I don't think. I'll, I'll eat them. If I go to a black event and there's chitlins on the table, you better believe I'm going to try them. Okay? But I am going to be worried because that one guy. Ah, Southern people. There it is. Susan corrects my wrong. It's not black people. It's Southern people. It's Southern people eat chitlins, right? Not black people. Would you say that's correct? Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. Um. So that is probably a more accurate description, right? See here, so what I'm getting at is that we need, I think, to have these conversations so that you can correct me, right? See, Susan comes along, he's like, no, 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 it's not black people, it's southern people. These are southern things. And I'm like, oh, so you're saying southern white people eat chitlins? Do southern white people eat chitlins? I don't know, but I sure want to know. I want to know. Do white southern people eat chitlins? I don't know. Okay? So I'll tell you another thing. Uh, I once uh, I lived in a place where uh, the guy next door to me was renting a, a, an apartment, and he was a black guy. He was actually a park ranger black park ranger very cool dude and we were talking about thanksgiving oh 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 southern people okay southern people eat greens okay that's true i'm telling you have you had greens susan uh and i will say it's it wasn't just black people that fed me greens it was uh a, a low-income white lady too and they were awesome awesome um so i was talking to this young black guy who was like, in my opinion, like doing an, an interesting career, like he'd gone to college and he was like a park ranger, you know, at any rate, I'm talking to him and he's like, so it was um, Thanksgiving and I'm like, hey man, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? He's like, oh, I go to my mom's. I'm like, oh, that's cool. What is your favorite Thanksgiving food? I asked him and he said macaroni and cheese and I said, what? He's like, yeah, what's yours? And I'm like, stuffing? He's like, ugh. Yeah, we have stuffing, but macaroni and cheese is the best. And I said, we don't get macaroni and cheese. <laughs> He's like, what? You don't get macaroni and cheese? I'm like, no, man, we don't make macaroni and cheese at white people Thanksgiving. He's like, oh, man, that's sad. <laughs> and I said, that is sad. <laughs> and so my wife and I were both having that conversation. She's like, I love macaroni and cheese. I'm like, let's make macaroni and cheese. And we brought macaroni and cheese to our Thanksgiving and we were properly made fun of. They're like, what the hell are you doing with macaroni and cheese at Thanksgiving? And I'm like, shut up, white person. Eat this macaroni and cheese. And you know what? They all ate it. They all ate that. They shut up and they were like, I don't know why we're having macaroni and cheese. They're eating all that macaroni and cheese. Because <laughs> my wife makes a mean macaroni and cheese probably her favorite food that's a big topic i don't want to just say that i don't want to but at any rate i love talking about this stuff because every time i talk about it especially in in, in any group i learn something i learn something and i find it very uh interesting Okay, now, Shannon says, it's a stereotype with the chicken watermelon, but has some basis due to the fact that on plantations that were chickens were a plenty and so were watermelons. Oh, so if the boss was withholding food as punishment, these things were easily taken and disposed of without repercussions. Okay, see? See? See, these are the things I need to know in the world. Thank you, Shannon, for learning me this stuff. Did you guys know that lobster was like something they ground up and gave to prisoners. I think on, what is that island? San Quentin, I don't know, Alcatraz or something. It was just garbage food. Lobsters were just freaking like bugs of the sea. And now it's like super expensive. So weird, so weird. Lobster's just a place to put melted butter in my opinion. I mean, it's fine. I don't, look. I'll never turn down a lobster with melted butter on it, but I hate paying for it. I rarely buy it. I rarely buy lobster because it's too damn expensive. It's ridiculous. So at any rate, I feel like we need to first understand what it means when you say you're racist, okay? 
And by what it means, you're not necessarily coming from an evil place. You're just coming from an ignorant place. So if somebody says, hey, that's racist, try to not let your white fragility get the best of you. It's going to be very difficult because white people are notoriously butthurt about uh, anything that they think they're not. But it's impossible to not be racist. It's impossible. Because we're all making generalizations that bleed over and will say something generalized that maybe is meaningful, okay? So, like, if we say there is a high crime rate in black communities, okay, that is probably a racist statement because it's not, at, I mean, are all black communities, do all black communities have a high crime rate? Absolutely not, okay? Absolutely not. But is there a high crime rate in some black communities? For sure. Is there a high crime rate in some white communities? For sure. The question is, is there more crime in a black community or a low-income community than, say, an upper-middle-class community? And these become very interesting questions, in my opinion, because I think we don't know the answer to that because black communities are being heavily policed by out-of-town white cops here in Akron. And the upper middle class people who are doing the drugs, smoking the pot, snorting the coke, getting hand jobs from masseuses. What else do uh, white collar criminals do? Oh, well, you know, cheat on their taxes, uh, insider trading. These are things that upper class white people do that don't get caught as easily because they're harder to track down and you know a cop can patrol I think anywhere he wants and he's like well I'm going to go over here where the black people are because damn I find any I can find somebody with drugs just I just turn on my little bubble gums and pick up the first car and I'll find drugs in it which is what I think a cop oftentimes thinks uh, any person, black, white, or otherwise, that's driving dirty deserves what they get. Don't drive dirty, people. Don't be stupid. Don't be driving around with drugs. I see my homeless people doing it all the time. I, I guess, what are you going to do? You need to take your drugs with you. What, man? You got to take your drugs with you. Um... So, I don't know. I don't know if there's more crime. Now, murders, it seems like a lot of murders in uh, America and Akron happen by uh, black men. I don't know offhand. I'm not going to look it up just because I'm too lazy. But do black men murder people more than white men on average? It's possible. It's possible. But then you have to ask why. The why is where it gets super interesting. Okay, let's see. Murder rates by race. Just look it up. Look it up. R race and crime. Okay, race and crime. Race and crime. Race and crime. Race and crime. Come on. Give me a nice... Give me a nice... This is not nice. I want a sheet. I want to, I want to, okay. Murder rates. Let's see. Homicide table. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This is table six, the 2019 crimes in the United States. Race of the victim. Race of the offender. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, race of the offender. White people. <laughs> there it is. See, I was wrong. 
wait, race of the offender, when the sex of the victim, okay, wait, race of the victim, oh, oh okay, okay, look, 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 okay, so, at, black people killed 566 people, they killed 2,574, I think they still win the number of total uh, murders, looks to me like, Total murders, black people more than white people. Just a little bit. It's close, though. But considering there's only 13% of the population is black, that's a pretty high rate, right? Okay. Um, so. Okay. 3,299 white people got murdered. 2,906 black people got murdered. Still way above the average, okay? Why is it, and this is what we like to call black-on-black -black crime, okay? Black-on-black -black crime. Why, but whatever happened to white-on-white -white crime? I mean, look at that. Look at that. Why do we not call, why do we not have white-on-white -white crime? The offender... 2,594 white murderers killed 3,299. You get me? You see? We love to talk about black on black crime. 2,574 offenders, 2,906 murders. Okay? All right. The sex of the offender. It's men, okay? Interestingly, we don't know some of the sex <laughs> of these offenders. I don't know. That's an interesting thing. Um, men are the problem. So, however, it does seem to me that a higher percentage on average of black people are killing are murdering at a higher rate than white people, seems to me, right? Okay. Let me find what, darn it. Okay. Uh, Shannon says, when you have more, you're more apt to obey set laws. When you have less and no opportunity for betterment, hopelessness sparks the lack of giving a fuck. Hopelessness can, and in many cases, mental breakdowns, yeah. With less to lose, you're like, well, I have, you know, who cares? I think that's true. Um, I would like to know by income level, right? Like, what's the murder rate by income level? Can we do that? What's the murder rate in the United States by income level? Okay. Uh, does crime increase? Income equality's most disturbing side effects, homicide. Let's do this. Okay. Okay. Uh, man, I just want big numbers. I don't want to be reading all day. I ain't got time to be reading. Oh, my Lord. Okay, what's the opening paragraph? Income equality can cause all kinds of problems across the economic spectrum, but perhaps most frightening is homicide. Inequality, the gap between a society's richest and poorest, predicts murder rates better than any other variable. It is more tightly tied to murder than straightforward poverty, for example, or drug abuse. And research conducted uh, that both between and within countries, about half the variance of murder rates can be accounted for by looking at the most common measure of inequality. Okay? Murders most associated with inequality are driven by a perceived lack of respect. Like most killings, they are mostly perpetrated by males, and in societies with low inequality, there tend to be very few murders. To an outsider, these deaths, when make up more than a third of the homicides, as known motives reported to the FBI, seem senseless. Senseless. A guy looks at someone else the wrong way, makes a disrespectful remark, or is believed to have winked at another man's wife or girlfriend. As you saw what happened at the Oscars, right? These incidents seem too trivial to matter to life and death. A prosperous guy like me, if someone insults me at a bar, I roll my eyes and leave. 
But if it's your local bar and you're unemployed or underemployed and your only source of status or self-respect is you're standing in the neighborhood, turning the other cheek looks weak and everyone soon knows you're an easy mark. Okay? Shannon says, men are more prone to criminal activity due to the fact that it's unacceptable to vent emotions, so therefore bottled up until they snap. I think that's right. And what about this respect issue? I think in particular, uh, black men, black communities are incredibly um, sensitive to respect and dignity, probably because they've been withheld it for 400 years in America, you know. So when there's great inequality, you're going to kill somebody over $50 that didn't, they didn't pay you back for your drugs, 50 bucks, you're going to kill them because you're like, look, man, you don't disrespect. I hear that all the time. Don't disrespect me. Do you know what happens to you if you call a man a bitch in a low income society? Don't do it. Don't fucking do it. It's, it's, um, you might as well uh, have punched their wife. Probably even worse. <laughs> Do not call a low-income man a bitch. Now, you can call a woman a bitch. I don't get it. They're fine with that. But you do not call a, you do not call a man in a low-income community bitch unless you're ready to go to war. They just don't do it don't do it they don't do it in prison they don't do it in the streets you don't do it and it comes back to this respect issue and what's interesting it's all about respect says shannon it's all about respect yeah and this is what's been interesting about having unk and cadillac and silly three black men on the church of the nomadic spirit board especially silly. Now, Unk and Cadillac uh, come with respect. They, they're, they're dignified, older black men that you respect and everybody respects them. They're respectful people. They're just, they demand respect. They command it. They, it. You can't not give them respect. But a guy like Silly, who is incredibly smart, uh, incredibly ambitious, incredibly thoughtful, you, uh, <laughs> yeah, see, Shannon says, I take being called a bitch a compliment. See, this is one of those things, like, if you were Japanese and you came to the, a poor neighborhood, you'd be like, okay, you can call the women a bitch, but don't you ever, ever, ever call the man a, bit, a man a bitch. You are, you are just, you are, you're not going to leave uh, walking. <laughs> you're not going to. Um, it's just interesting, you know, like in the, in the, in the, uh, motorcycle culture, you know, having a bitch on the back or whatever. It's, it's interesting, right? These are interesting social mores. It is just very, very interesting. Uh, Shannon says, I wear a bitch badge proudly right on. Absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, but it's been really interesting to watch silly because he got this role as being vice president of the Church of the Nomadic Spirit, and I could see instantly his demeanor change. And he's like, "Hey guys, we got to keep, we got to clean up this trash around here. We can't live like this. We gotta, you know, we have to be respectful to our neighbors. We have to be respectful to the property." And I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, wow!" Now, and then that's when it hit me. We have to find ways for low-income men in particular not uh, but the men are driving the crime right the violence so i think we have to start with the men and if, if you disagree with that please let me know ah look at that look what shannon says calling a man a bitch is like symbolically neutering him bam so powerfully said so powerfully said we got to find avenues for our inner city men 
to get positions of respect and authority. And I don't think it has to be a job. I think it can be in social groups. It could be in, you know, community. Like, what about something that we need in our communities are, are watch groups. There's, look, the police are not there to protect you from when your stuff gets stolen, okay? Some lady was on next door this morning all upset that somebody had stolen a package off of her porch. That's not what the police are there to do. They're there to go catch the criminal, which they're not going to catch that person. They're not going to. They don't have time. But they'll catch an arsonist. They'll catch a, a murderer. Even somebody that attempted murder, they'll, they'll go for those people, right? They catch criminals after the act. They are not stopping crime from happening, whereas a good community watch group could be all about stopping crime from happening. Now, you got to be careful. These, this can open a can of worms, um, but... I really like the idea of community watch groups, and um, why not have our young black men run them, you know? Why not put them in charge? Why not teach them self-defense? Why not, you know, give them these, these potential jobs? Why not uh, have young men run uh, community food centers? Um, why not help these young men develop their arts like um, street art or rap or any music, musical, like, you know, any kind of music? How about more sports leagues? How about inner city sports leagues? How about chess? A lot of guys I know learned chess in prison. Chess clubs. Anything where you can succeed. Now, where it's easy to succeed is drugs. Everybody has an opportunity to move up the drug ladder. And if you haven't seen the social um, constructs of being a drug dealer, you are missing something very interesting and very powerful. Where a person sits at a table is ordained by how important they are. Who eats first? Who goes gets food? People bring food to drug dealers, okay? People run errands for drug dealers. You are given respect as a drug dealer. Now, the reason you're given respect is because you have something they want. Um, and, you, you know, oftentimes you'll give out favors of drugs to people that treat you well. Janet says, we need mentorship programs here in Akron. We had dad for a day interested in setting up a program, but the mayor said no. Really? So, one, I, I really think we need to understand drug culture much better because it's super fascinating and it makes a lot of sense why people want to go into drug dealing. Because you can be an authority, you can get respect by being a drug dealer. If you're selling drugs, you instantly start up the ladder of respect, and it goes from there. That the, the, the ground-level drug dealer just selling a little bit of drugs on the street gives you instant respect. And then the more you climb up, the higher, the more respect you get. And then you're driving big, really nice cars. You're, you're rolling with you know, stacks of cash. You've got the coolest guns, and your posse is all around you. You're just, you are a god. Okay? 
So, and then it just follows you right into prison. You can still be that guy. You can put out hits in prison. You can still run your drug uh, empire from prison. It's all kinds of good. It's like the mob. And so when we don't have any kinds uh any kind of place for young males in the inner city um they're just going to gravitate towards where they can find it hey chris christopher james please watch our video from last night i really need you to hear what chris uh Christopher's thoughts are for the city. Very, very, very thoughtful human being, Christopher. He says, someone bought a house and a car with drug money in Akron in 2018, and he didn't get caught until this year. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then uh, Shannon uh, comes in and says, yep, because you feel needed and powerful because people need what you got, therefore needing you. We got to understand that. We have to understand these cultural situations. Otherwise, we're never going to fix it. And I do think we're on to something. Uh, uh, Christopher believes the root of most of the problems in Akron and other cities is poverty. And I think poverty does lead to the lack of respect and dignity. Uh, whereas people used to have po um, respect in good quality jobs, and the jobs that they have right now are, do not lead to respect. They just don't. You know, you don't get a, a good job like at Chrysler or Goodyear anymore. You know, you're not getting those kinds of jobs. You can be fired in an instant. Uh, you're not paid well. You don't get any benefits. Blah 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 blah. So I think personally, we got to look for new ways to empower uh, young men in the cities uh, with positions of respect and dignity. I think so. Um, that's enough for one day. I'm starving. I haven't eaten all day. I got to go get a snack. You people are awesome. Stay strong. Um, I hope you're having a nice weekend or summer, I should say. It's not the weekend. It's the weekend of the, of the year. Jan says, we need mentorship for young women as much as young men. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's that's true. You're a hundred percent right. Uh, that was very chauvinistic of me to not to to just focus on uh, young men. W mentorship is, I think, the right word, uh, Shannon. We need mentorship. We need interesting programs that uh, young people, young women, young men would find interesting. There's a uh, there's. Um, a guy that I really like, his uh, name is Tony, and he lived at our tent village for um, a long time. And, you know, he's done the whole thing. He's done prison, he's drugs, uh, and he's been sober for a year now. And he went through this really cool program, and he's as cool as it gets. This guy is as cool as it gets. And he would be a great mentor, a great mentor. All right, everybody, I love you. You have a great day. Peace and light to you, Shannon. You're wonderful. You are all wonderful. Thank you for being on this planet with me. You uh, make it all worthwhile. I will see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to Sage and the Houseless Movement, a weekly show dedicated to the news and views of the homeless locally and worldwide.